All right, good afternoon, everyone. We thank you so much for coming out to the health workshop today. If you could please take your seats. All right, so I have the pleasure and honor to introduce today's um, speaker. Um, we heard Rosalind Brock talk about self-care and social and community care being necessity uh, for the work that we do in civil rights and social justice. So I said, what a better way to go into our next segment, which is our health, right? And we're going to talk about something that we need to really be exploring as a community, which is mental health, right? And so we are living in times where we are exposed to horrendous um, footage, things that are really difficult to watch, and they're always our brothers and sisters. Um, things that, um, you know, we're always, we're, our baseline is fight, where others get to have the, the privilege of just existing. And so I just want to introduce to you Dr. Elisha Hall. Dr. Elisha Hall works to enhance the lives of African descendant peoples through African centered praxis. 
that centers African culture and history. The African Indigenous and Indigenous Knowledge Institute, AIKI, works to disseminate local methods, practices, curricular materials, facilitation styles, and knowledge of individuals, families, and organizations. This learning institute informs participants on how they can achieve greater individual and systemic form transformation. Further, it provides a blueprint on how to use African and indigenous knowledge to heal from past traumas at home, in school, and in within co communities. There's an African proverb that says, a wise man fills his mind before he empties his mouth. And so with that being said, I want you to be ready to be filled so that we can all be wiser, <laughs> wiser for and better cared for ourselves and our community and our village. So with that, I'd like to introduce the founder of AIKI, African and Indigenous Knowledge Institute, Dr. Elisha Hall. Thank you, Crystal, for that warm introduction. Um, I think I need to just bring Crystal around everywhere I go so that um, I can be received as such. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you all doing? I was strong. Um, in the African Center tradition, I'm going to ask for my elders' permission to begin before I can begin. So from the elders in the room, do I have permission to continue? Yeah. All right, Ashe. Asante Sana, which means deep gratitude or thank you in Kiswahili. So we are here today to talk about thriving in the face of trauma, racism, mental health, and healing in this Juneteenth era. And even that title is a whole bunch to kind of, to kind of process, right? But I want you all to think about what Rosalind talked about. She talked about all these different kind of conditions that we have been experiencing, what that we are continuing to face, that continue to face, and we continue to face currently, economic conditions, social conditions, based on race, based on where, where uh, zip code we live in. There are studies right now that will tell you how long you can live based on the zip code that you live in. This presentation is gonna tell you what all of that does to our bodies, to our minds and how we need to kind of respond to it, how we need to remove that, those conditions, how we don't, well, so that we don't hold on to them. Because if you don't do it, your body will hold on to it. And it, will and it can create conditions within the body. So what we're trying to do, what I'm trying to do, help you all understand those conditions and release them so that they don't create conditions in your mind and in your body. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's what we're doing here today. So let's just um, kind of, this is what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna just start by defining some terms. What do we mean we're talking about thriving? What do we mean when we're talking about health? Uh, when we, what do we mean when we're talking about trauma? Okay, Crystal talked about the content that we are constantly um, taking in, right? Social media, videos. Um, that's content that has, that is directly impacting your mind and your body, all right? And that creates trauma. That If you watch that content, you are literally consuming trauma just by watching it. We might say, oh, I didn't experience it, so I, I'm not traumatized by it. No, you're actually experiencing trauma when you watch it. And the problem is now that we're so used to watching it, we're actually, you know, we become accustomed to watching it, right? So now it gets easier to watch, even though it shouldn't, right? And there are even studies that show on the University of Chicago, um, show, there's a, did a study about trauma, and they showed that even children who hear gunshots, when they go to school the next day, they perform worse in the classroom. Why? Because hearing a gunshot is what? A traumatic event. And so there are studies that show it is harder for you to do your work when you have been traumatized. So we have to understand what these things do to us and understand how, again, to release them, to move through them, and, and not allow them to get us to places where, we're, where it's impacting our mental, our psychological, and our physical health. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how that trauma works, but we're also going to talk about from an african center perspective and go back to an African antiquity and talk about how uh, historically, Africa has thought about health, 
has thought about disease, has taught about mental health. We're also going to talk about our melanin, okay, and how because we have melanin, we actually need to be feeding our melanin, and we're different than folks that have less melanin. Y'all following me? Okay, so we're going to move all the way through that, and then we'll start talking about black people in mental health conditions and challenges, and we're going to finish with tools that you all can use every day to, um, to actually improve your mental health, okay? So, we'll start with a proverb, and I love that we've been hearing proverbs all day, so this is just another proverb for you all to kind of digest. Um, this one is from the Akan people. This is out of Ghana. And they say we must use Sankofa. Sankofa is an Andikra symbol that comes out of the Akan tradition. And these Adinkra symbols were literally symbols that they drew that so that they could represent big, large ideas. And there are hundreds of them. And Sankofa means to go back and fetch in order to go forward. It's represented by a bird or a heart. And so this proverb says, we must use Sankofa to go back with an understanding of the previous seven generations in order to prepare for the next seven generations. That's 14 generations, okay? This is how they think about their concept of, are we doing enough for our children? Uh, how are we planning? How are we making sure that we are teaching what our children need to know. How many of you all can go back seven generations and actually know what is there, right? This proverb for black people is real deep because a lot of that memory, historical knowledge has been severed, okay? So, but for them, this is in their proverb, which means this is what they're passing on to their people, their children, this is how they think about life. And so I really want you all to think about what does it mean to have that stretch <laughs> of knowledge and to always be thinking about the next generation. Especially, uh, well, and let me just go back. Especially when we talk about trauma and mental health, because this is also an intergenerational uh, a kind of impact that, ha that happens to families. So that means that you can pass on trauma from one generation to the next. Are y'all following me? So when you're talking about like what's going on and what you're experiencing, and this is one of the reasons why I don't like talking, you know, too much about, um, you know, so you'll say, oh, well, you know, you're kind of uh, predisposed or whatever, you know, you've got kind of genetically this predisposed. But <laughs> yes, because of the trauma <laughs> and the racism, we've been genetically predisposed to a whole lot. But we can also change that genetic predisposition, but the doctor doesn't talk about that part. So we have to understand, and I'm gonna talk about how you can change it today, okay? So let's be focused on that. Let's focus on what we can change and what we can do, not necessarily just what we've been caught up in. So I love that uh, Rosalind talked about, th really Rosalind and I really should just take the show on the road, okay? <laughs> I don't know how she did this, but we were just connected at the hip, okay? So she talked about Thrive, and that was in her presentation, that was in her, 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 rem her remarks today. And, and literally, that's what I talk about. Here it is, boom, to thrive, to flourish, to prosper. That's what we're talking about. And we want to be thriving, right? And the title here, when we're talking about thriving in the face of trauma, this is important because in this Juneteenth era, we have a holiday for Juneteenth, right? But do we have reparations? <laughs> but, but have we fully healed, right? Right? So that's what I, that's why I'm talking about in this Juneteenth era, where they're giving us what they want to give us, but what have they not given us? Right? What concessions are they not making for us? And I will talk about reparations, and I always talk about it in terms of institutional reparations, structural reparations, individual reparations, spiritual reparations. <laughs> institutional, yeah. Colleges, right? You know, all of these kinds of things. Companies. They can give reparations. Structural reparations, that's government saying, yeah, here's a check, whatever, what have you, right? Now, that individual, yeah, an individual might want to give some money, et cetera, but that spiritual reparations, nobody can give that back to you. You have to heal yourselves. So that's what today is about, learning. How are we healing ourselves? How are we always thinking about healing in our conversations with ourselves and our children, our grandchildren? Because no one is going to give that to you. You have to take that on yourselves. So we talked about trauma. 
And just doing some de defining some terms, we're talking about an emotional response to a terrible event, an accident, rape, natural disaster, okay? And immediately after the event, there's shock, denial, that might happen, but there can be other reactions, right? Emotions, flashbacks, trig you could be triggered, you know, you can have strained relationships, even physical symptoms like headaches and nausea, okay? Um, and then, you know, the people, you know, might have difficulty moving on with their lives and things of that nature, all right? Um, and again, you know, there's, um, we can name all kinds of things in our communities that create that a, a trauma, okay? I talked about gunshots, um, d you know, domestic violence. We saw that during the pandemic, domestic violence was up um, in black homes, right? And a lot of that was being undeported, uh, unreported. That's trauma, right? Imagine those children and what they're going through. Also, during the pandemic, children were being forced to study and to learn virtually. That's trauma. We're gonna actually look at a slide that shows how more children now, um, I actually, uh, they're, they're, they're saying that more of them have experienced trauma as a result of the pandemic. And we know that when we look at these national numbers that the, the, the numbers for black people are even higher, okay? So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about trauma in, in those ways, the trauma that we kind of understand, but also looking the, the, the trauma that you're getting from you know, the content, the social media, all the things that are going on in the world, all of that is trauma as well. Um, and so we'll, we understand these things uh, kind of from a, um, you know, kind of just from a, 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 a physical, kind of an emotional standpoint. Um, but we're also starting to learn more about the intergenerational piece around the trauma. Um, this is why, you know, people have wrote and written about uh, post-traumatic uh, slave syndrome, right? And talking about how, the, how black people uh, experienced trauma simply as being uh, descendants, African descendants that experienced enslavement, okay? Very real what's happening with us today. But if we don't know this, if we're not talking about it, if it's not in our um, lexicon, if it's not in our conversation, our dialogues, you know, then we're not even bringing it up. At the end, we'll talk about some of the things that you all can do um, to kind of really address some of this. And one of those is, is actually having a therapist, having a psychologist, actually doing that work so that we can get, and actually having someone who has a black and or African-centered uh, kind of approach so that they, you don't have to explain everything to them. Like, well, I gotta explain this to you. <laughs> That's a lot of work. Okay. That could be traumatizing. <laughs> so yes, there's a lot of work that we're gonna go into uh, with this presentation. And, um, and yeah, we'll, we'll end with some tools as well. Because I don't like presentations that talk about the problem, but don't really give you any solutions. So here we are going back to African antiquity. Now, when we talk about African antiquity and trying to understand how they thought and, and, uh, about health and illness and disease, we're talking about 5,000, 6,000 years ago, okay? So for them, and we're talking about ancient Kemet and ancient Egypt specifically right now, okay? So for them um, and other African cultures in West Africa that kind of took on all of these similar kinds of traditions and worldviews and understandings, they see health as a journey towards achieving balance in an environment and social relations within the families, peers, and society, okay? We're right here, S and deities. So it's the environment, it's family, it's peers, and it's their spiritual. Your health is a reflection of all of that. That means that health has always been interconnected. It's never been separate from all of these pieces, okay? So then as a result, you know, comp accomplishments, prosperity, joy, and living in balance with family and community and society are indicators of good health, all right? So this is important because they say a mentally healthy person is one who strives to be in harmony with forces or nature impinging on him or her, okay? That's really important. That's what we're talking about. You're talking about striving towards the highest epitome of health, right? A divine health, if you will, that's in harmony, regardless of the forces that are coming against you, right? Regardless of the trauma that you experience. And this is in Africa where they don't have to deal with racism, right? At this time, we're talking about African antiquity, right? So we have to understand that they're defining this and, and they have the environment that is kind of harmonious and, and they are still saying, but in adversity, you must kind of achieve that health by moving through it and constantly striving towards it, okay? 
And then they say, finally, and from the African cultural lens, it has a greater emphasis on spirit, balance, connectedness, wholeness in the individual and the environment, okay? Very important, extremely important. So what does this mean? How do we can continue to, oh, well, let me go back. Now, for, un for an unhealthy person and for disease, it says that ill health is socially constructed and reflective of disharmonious relationships, okay? So this means that you could have a disruption between the, the, the physical and the spiritual. This means that you could have disharmony between people, between people and their ancestors, between an individual and the rest of the universe, and a break in the reality beyond the in individual existence, all right? This is uh, Bojwe and uh, Molestain Kake in 2018, talking about the African understanding of ill health. So this means that, you know, we can look at your social relationships, we can look at your family and understanding the kind of health. But they also understood that health, if you had a physical ailment, okay, that was only a representation of probably a, some spiritual ailment that you were also dealing with. So they didn't see them as separate, they saw them as connected. Does that make sense? And that physical was a representation. So what are we talking about in terms of, of how this, what this means for us? Why is this important? Well, this is important because as African, as descendants of Africa, we have melanin in us. We are a melanated people. We look beautiful too, don't we? <laughs> and <laughs> I, I know that's right. We sure do. And that melanin, but that melanin is, uh, so this is African biochemistry. That melanin actually is charged. Did you all know this? It is charged and it needs to be taken care of, okay? So there's melanin in the entire body. It's in skin, hair, vital organs, but it's a living molecule. It's a life chemical charged like a battery. It has 200 atoms. So if you have melanin that needs to be charged, then you got to understand what your melanin needs, okay? And I live in Chicago, right? I know my melanin is not getting what it needs living in Chicago from uh, October to uh, May, <laughs> okay? My melanin is not happy with me, okay? But from this presentation, you also learn if you're eating certain foods, your melanin is not happy with you. So what do I mean by that? Well, it... A melanin human body, uh, a melanated human body is synonymous with chlorophyll in plants, okay? This means that melanin is, is a converter of a physical energy and it's important for proper human physiology. So what does that mean? It means that it has, uh, it can become toxic and adversely affects the biochemistry in the body, right? So just like you know, so nitrile oxide, which is like, you know, rich plants and foods, is essential for African biochemistry, all right? You have to feed your melanin rich plants and foods in order for it to thrive. And remember, we talked about that word. We don't want not to survive, not to be okay, but to thrive and, and, and really get everything that it needs. And I'm going to talk about the specific diet that you all, that it needs uh, uh, coming up. Um, so very important, very important, very important for us to understand. Now also, we're still in ancient Kemet here, right? So I just want to give you all some facts because people might say, oh, well, ancient Kemet, they, what did they know about science? What did they know about medicine, right? Well, actually, the first, the first, um, one of the first documented, you know, cases of, of medicine and the doctor in, ha actually happened in ancient Kemet, okay? So they were there and they were able to, uh, you know, detect diseases. They practiced surgery. They extracted medicine from plants and knew the circulation of the blood 4,000 years before Europe, okay? They also taught frequent uses of, of enemas, all right? In 1500, they also, uh, they also were able to recognize a connection between food and disease. So in 1500 BC, they had brain surgery, gynecology, obstetrics, I might be pronouncing that wrong, herbal, con <laughs> obstetrics, thank you, thank you, uh, my <laughs> uh, herbal contraceptives in 2000 BC. They could look at a woman's urine 
as a preg uh, as in a for pregnancy and be able to detect uh, the sex of the baby. This is in 2000 BC. Meanwhile, modern science did not do it until 1926. 1926. That's almost four. That's 3,000 years later. Almost 4,000 years later. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about how when we say advanced civilizations, we're talking about advanced civilizations. They were doing all of this. When we talk about African antiquity, we're talking about this kind of brilliance. And, um, and this is just a tip of the iceberg. Um, and they were also using lasers and therapeutic power of light uh, as early as 6,000 BC. So this is just a, you know, a kind of sampling. Uh, and this was because of Imhotep, who was many kind of, uh, kind of consider him as the, the father of medicine, all right, coming out of ancient Kemet and ancient Egypt. So where else do we see this? And, you know, Af African-centered uh, scholars, we like to not just look at ancient Kemet, we also like to look at other civilizations as well to make our points that this is across the whole African diaspora. This is an, an African and indigenous way of being, worldview. This is not just in one place. And that's what makes it great, is that all across the time, space, continuum, you see similar things. You see this being done in a different way. So here we have in Yoruba, which is out of Ifa, which is in Nigeria, okay? And we see them doing what? They are associating different parts of the body and body and organs with deities, okay? With their kind of spiritual power, if you will. Lungs, brain, um, pancreas, all right? So it's just showing you that they understood that these things had a connection with the spiritual world as well. Now, as we start to get into us now, let's start to understand, and, and we've already talked about this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But we under, now we're getting into, okay, so how are we moving into all that's going on, and how are we dealing with all that's going on, and how, what are we doing with it, and what is it doing to us? All right? Where again, Rosalind mentioned, the housing, right, the economy, inflation, all of these things. All right, so we're coming, we're gonna get started. So, you know, a big part of all of this is the impact that it's having. And one of the things that we're starting to see here um, is that the social and cultural capital, the environmental events, neighborhood, the economic, all of this is having an impact right here, okay? Right here. How so? Let's keep going. Um, a big part of what we saw before the pandemic was that we were, 13% of black people were in poverty, 13%, and we know that that number has gone up, okay? We know that 4% um, of the US population was unemployed, but about 7% of the black patient population is unemployed. We know that 11% of the US population had food insecure, are food insecure, but 21% of uh, black populations, food insecure, okay? And household income, boom, 61,000. Rosslyn talked about it, right? 41,000 for black Americans, okay? This is pre-pandemic, so these numbers are actually, that's what we're talking about, worse. They're getting, they're worse now, okay? So let's continue, all right? Um, now there's a lot of talk about the social determinants of health, right? But that, is really a, is all a lot of that is uh, newer in the conversation, and, um, and but the reality is that this has been going on for a very long time. Okay, um, so let's continue. When we look at this and understand how, what impacts our health, this I think is a really important slide. Thirty per well, let me start first. Forty percent of our of our health comes from the social and economic factors, all right? This is, this is what we just went through. 40% is coming from that space alone, all right? That's really, 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 really important. Now, 30% is coming from health behaviors, okay? So now you put those two together, we got 70%. Some of this is coming from our environment, social and economic factors, which we've named, and then this other, for say right here is health behaviors. That's 70% total. Now, 10% is coming from 
our physical environment. There is a uh, documentary on Netflix right now. It talks about you know though uh, like how to live you know past 100, like to lo the longest, and you know and have a long life. And it one of the things that it shows is that those that are born in hills, in environments where that are mountainous or, or, or hit with hills, actually live longer than other people. Why? Because that 10% that's physical environment, they're always walking all the time. I was in Puerto Rico uh, in the hills of San Juan. I was like, man, this is steep. <laughs> Can you imagine walk, doing that walk just to go get some food, just to go get some anything? <laughs> anything. And it puts your body in a different kind. You know, that's, those, that's health behaviors and physical environment. That means every day you are putting in health the health behaviors you need to be healthy. Okay? That's extremely important. So if you live in a physical environment where you don't have that, that means you have to work even harder to get a workout, to get your body to be healthy. All right. And then lastly here, this is 20% clinical care. All right. So we did 80% here and then 20% clinical care, and that's your health. That's kind of what drives health outcomes. And of course, for black people, these numbers can change. And we know that, you know, here, uh, you know, we're seeing maternal health and things of that nature, which is horrible and, and, and extremely, um, you know, just heartbreaking across the country. That number might be higher, right? Um, but this is kind of the average. And this brings us then to kind of understanding the racism and understanding enslavement and, and what it's done to us, but also understanding soul food and what we've inherited, right, from all that racism. Because many of us know the story of, uh, of soul food, right? These, this food that we ate, why? Because our ancestors wanted to eat it because it was the best food ever? No, because it was the leftovers, right? And so what we have typically done as black folks as we have taken that soul food and like we love it because we've got dinners with big mama and my children and everything right and it's cool and it's great but the food is not necessarily what our melanin needs not what our melanin wants what our melanin needs okay so let's let's explore that a little bit more what are we talking about when we're talking about what our melanin needs um and we'll get to it in a minute. So I want to stop here. Let me take a little break with this one. Rasima Manakim says, trauma in a people over time can look like culture. And so I, that's why I couldn't start with this one. You know, I had to build up to it. But this is so important especially when we're talking about soul food, and especially when we're talking about a lot of the things that we may have learned and inherited that aren't necessarily what we need to move on and or teach our children in the next generation. So you'll say, oh, well, Dr. Hall, well, you know, what are you talking about? Okay, well, let's get to it. So here we're going to start with food and start with kind of what is, and we're going to watch some videos because, you know, as a, as, a, as a teacher, we all know that you can say a lot. Of, as a parent, I have three children. Uh, we know you can say a lot of things, but it don't matter unless you bring somebody else in to really talk about what you're talking about. So, so let's do that. We're going to bring somebody in, and then I will come back after the video. Did you hear what this brother said? Raise your hand if you knew that. Okay. Okay, put your hands down. Different products of food, different, the restaurants have different food in other countries that they are not selling here because the rules and the regulations in the other countries are more stringent than the ones here. So they are selling us the most bottom of the bottom 
with chemicals that are not good for our body. And when we talk about the call leading these causes of death for black people, cancer, right? All of these di diabetes and these kinds of things, get, those come from what you consume. A lot of that comes from what you consume, okay? We have to understand that. And this is not our, this is not fully our fault. I'm telling you all, this is what's not being talked to you. This is what's not being told to you, right? Because they're trying to make a profit. So what we're trying to say is, hey, you know, you, we need to know this, you need to understand it, and how to, here's how you address it, okay? Uh, because ultimately, it's like, we're talking about being informed, uh, 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 the uh, um, governor, lieutenant governor said you were uh, an informed voter, right? You have to be an informed consumer. And that's really what it's about for us, especially as black people, especially as melanated people, especially when the, we, we might assume, I think as black folks, we assume <laughs> that this company or that this government is gonna do right by us. But the reality is, is they're not. And we have to, we have to there, and therefore we have to take our health in our own hands. All right, we're gonna do the next video, please. Did you hear what that brother said? Sugar. Okay. How many of you all know that they were putting sugar, McDonald's put sugar on their french fries? Did you all know this? Now, you might ask, well, why would uh, this multi-billion dollar, you know, food conglomerate like McDonald's put sugar on their french fries? And then you read that last piece that he said, where sugar is more eight times more addictive than cocaine. Well, when you mix sugar with salt in the McDonald's fish fry, chemically, it's, it's actually the same chemically as cocaine. Like, that's that addictive, that, that's piece that they're talking about. Your body can't really tell the difference because they've put, that's why they're putting that sugar in there. Do you know that uh, KFC, uh, KFC and these Popeyes, you know they are paying scientists hunt like hundreds of scientists sometimes you know, across the country, but some might have dozens of scientists in their company just to make you more addicted to their food. Research and development is, is deep. So that's what we're saying. That, this is why we're like, uh, you know, people are like, oh, that's, you know, and, or you know, social media a couple years ago and the, ch the chicken sandwich came out and they were like, man, that's fire, that's crack. I don't know if y'all heard that. This is a younger person, I don't know, she I was like, man, it's crazy that they were saying that because I was like, think about mine, like it actually is. They're making it to be the most addictive thing that you have that day. And we hope you come back for more. And we're gonna sell it to you for $3. For $3. Right? We have to understand, okay? So now we're talking about, you know, that this is not just by happenstance and this is, we're, this is like, this is, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, Intentional, it's intentional. And that's why we have to be intentional about what we consume, what we don't consume, and really uh, informed you know, uh, uh, about how, um, what we bring into, into our bodies. So uh, raise your hand if you know Dr. Sebi. Okay, okay, we got a little, little bit, good. So I'm gonna I'm, uh, help you all teach a little bit here about this young uh, brother, this ancestor, dear ancestor of ours. So Dr. Sebi, um, you know, uh, kind of a, a uh, famous, um, uh, I think he's Honduran, if I'm not mistaken. He was a doctor, uh, and he, c he was known for, um, in the 90s, you know, really bringing out health and really introducing the alkaline diet to uh, black people specifically. Uh, but, you know, ultimately he was healing a lot of people. 
um, and even healed, um, what is it, left eye or T-Boz, if I'm not mistaken, left eye, yes. So he um, just has been about saying to people, we need to be eating what is alkaline and not what is acidic, period. That's where he really got his, his, his fame from. And he was this, because he's saying that, you know, um, when acid is in the body, it turns into inflammation, and, 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 and ultimately, that's what gets you sick. So his whole thing was, we need to rid the body of acid, of inflammation, and therefore, we will be healthy, okay? And he talks about an alkaline diet, all right, to do that. And when we're talking about alkalinity versus uh, uh, acidic, uh, kind of acidic kind of state, we're talking about, you know, the pH scale, if you will, all right? Science class, you know, kind of, you know, what, what um, you know, is alkaline versus what is not. So here um, on the left are the alkaline foods. And guess what feeds your melanin? You all think the, th this is an easy point for you all today. The alkaline foods or the acidic foods? The alkaline, okay? So when it was talking about the alkaline, the, that your melanin needs this kind of, you know, rich, um, um, uh, kind of plants and things of that nature, all of those things are on this side, okay? So we're talking, and, and this is important too because not all fruits and vegetables are alkaline, not all fruits and vegetables are good for you, um, and you know, we don't, we don't talk about it like that, you know, we don't think about it on that level, but this brother did, and he was very, very influential in, in the work that he was able to do, getting people to kind of reconsider their health and, 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 and heal, ultimately, and to heal. And so when we're talking about this, you know, um, you know, we're not going to go too extensively into this list, but I just want you all to know that it's here, okay? Um, you know, there's not only are there alkaline foods uh, and vegetables, but there's alkaline um, grains as well, okay? So for instance, uh, rice, you know, white rice, but you know, basmati rice, things like that, that's not alkaline. But what is alkaline is black rice, okay, for example, right? So things that um, alkaline, uh, things that are alkaline are things that are better for your body, are easy to break down, um, you know, and of course, we know that also with this is, there's a study that shows that like organic food um, has 40% more nutrients than inorganic food or than GMO food. So it's important for us not just to consume what's alkaline and, and fruits and vegetables for our, 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 our melanin. It's important to consume the organic because we're living in an environment where we are not getting the superfoods that you might see in the Caribbean and in Africa or you know, uh, in these other places where their, <laughs> you know, their food is powerful, okay? So we are not getting that, so we, it's, it's important for us to eat organic as well. But if you can't eat organic for whatever reason, you know, then, uh, then uh, it's great to be on an alkaline diet. Now, I'm also an advocate of saying to people, you know, you have to try, you know, if it works for you and, and everybody has a blood type, there are people who who's confess on a blood type diet, ultimately you have to figure out what works for you. But just the fact that you are starting to think about it, starting to make some choices, that's what matters, you know. So this is about taking your health in your own hands, again, not just for you, but for the future generations, okay? Um, so, and also, this is important. So, of course, we know that meat, so here's beef, you know, dairy, these things are over here. Um, cheese, you know, it's crazy because <laughs> so much of the country is lactose intolerant, but they still eat the, the dairy, you know? Um, and we're actually one of the, we're the only a uh, animal species that, that drinks another species' milk. Did you all know that? You even think about it that way? So this is why the dairy is not good for us. I'm serious. <laughs> I'm dead serious. But guess what's, guess what's one of the most addicting foods that we eat? It's on pizza. Cheese. Cheese is one of the most addicting foods that we eat. Because it's not just uh, the taste of cheese, it's the texture, it's like chewy, it's like, oh my goodness, right? <laughs> so these things are addictive, not just because they taste good sometimes, but, you know, and then, you know, if you have these kind of memories and things of that nature with these foods, 
it's hard to separate. You know, it's hard to say no. It's hard to move on. Now, thankfully, it's 2023, 2024. There are a lot of alternatives to these foods. There are a lot of uh, non-dairy alternatives that are phenomenal. Cashew milk ice cream, right? Uh, coconut milk ice cream, all these things, right? So you can start making some of those choices. There's cashew, uh, cashew milk pizza at Whole Foods, okay? Um, you can, and of course you can make these uh, kind of uh, healthier alternatives yourself. However, be careful because not all alternatives are considered equal and not all, all of them are healthy. For example, there are a lot of vegan fast food restaurants. You better be careful. You better be careful. For inst because, for instance, there is, um, um, what's the burger uh, that came out? Impossible. impossible. Thank you. It, it's, imp it, it's impossible for the impossible burger to be healthy for you. <laughs> <laughs> that was a dad joke. I apologize for that. I apologize for that. But it's not. Do you know why? Because there's so much salt in it. You all know this. Have you heard? It, there is so much salt in the Impossible Burger. It is literally one of the most unhealthiest things in the market. They had to recall it because it was so unhealthy. And just because, you know, since they saying, y'all know what I'm, what I'm saying is true now, if they saying that, okay? So it's crazy because that burger that got recalled, it also got approved. What are we, do what are we doing? It also got approved. So we have to be very careful about um, kind of, you know, these uh, quote unquote fake meats, you know, that, that exist. And also these restaurants, because there's a lot of vegan restaurants that are just frying food that's not good for you and then saying here. Um, and that's different than, uh, you know, kind of plant-based restaurants or others, you know, that are alkaline. There's an alkaline vegan fast food restaurant in Chicago. Powerful brother running is a powerful restaurant. He's now they're frying some things, but ultimately, you know, um, it's 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 a much healthier version uh, of what we need and what uh, what our bodies need. So we have to be very careful. And then lastly, about this slide, um, I want to show you all is uh, this food pyramid. We all know it, right? This has actually changed the food pyramid because when we get the food pyramid at school, and when we've been taught this food pyramid, it's not healthy. <laughs> Right, uh, and and for us as melanated people, we need this at the bottom. This is the this one that needs to be the most vegetables, and fruit is the second one most. This should be like sixty to sixty percent, seventy percent of what you're consuming. Okay, and then we've got whole grains and legumes, and then nuts and oils, and then these. This is the acid right here. If you consumed only 10% of acid a day, you would be healthier. Just 10%, right? I'm not even asking you all not to consume any. The acid should be a sometimes food. It should not be an everyday food. And that's why we see the health issues because we've, we've, we've made it an everyday food. So we have to really start to get our health back in check and really address you know, some of the kind of acidic uh, kind of, kind of um, habits and, and, and ultimately, you know, uh, diets that we can, that we're on. And the crazy part about this is that we talked about um, trauma. Well, trauma can lead to stress, right? And stress can lead to what? Stress eating. Okay. Stress eating. Yes, please. But uh, please write it down. Yes. Uh, and so stress eating is, is huge. People who are, are dealing with trauma and are dealing with uh, uh, stress, they, they use eating and st stress eating to cope with what they're dealing with. So if you are, have anxiety, that might also happen, right? So you need to then have healthy snacks <laughs> by your side if you're a stress eater, okay? Know yourself and, 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 and um, pri prioritize your health and really put that forward. All right, so let's go to um, here. This again, we're talking about alkaline. Um, these are some of the grains that uh, we were talking about. So this is amaranth, um, which is a really powerful grain. This is uh, 
um, Kamut. These are some of the original grains. Again, um, Kamut was found in ancient Egypt as an original grain that they were using 6,000 years ago, okay? Um, quinoa, okay? So a lot of people are using quinoa instead of rice altogether, okay? Um, there's uh, teff here, which is a great uh, grain. It actually, if you, if you garden and, and, and uh, put it in the soil, it actually cleans, helps to clean the soil as well. Um, there's spelt. Okay, and wild rice. I was talking about that black rice, right? So these are positive grains that you can have on a regular basis that are going to be healthy for that are going to be better for you. Okay, um, Brazil nuts. Okay, hemp seeds, raw sesame seeds. All right, um, walnuts. Okay, uh, these are the nuts uh, and seeds. Uh, and then I think there's avocado oil down here, but not all and, and um, but not all oils are, are good for you as well. So you have to be careful, right? Which oils you're consuming. Um, so this is something. If you all look up alkaline diet, these things will come up. Please do. Um, we're gonna hear from another person talking about the importance of uh, alkaline. Get your charge back up, okay? That's so, so, so important. So, and again, he's talking about being out of balance, okay? And getting your diet, getting your, those, those habits back in alignment, okay? Um, that's extremely important. So, um, one of the other things that I love about what's alkaline is um, watermelon, okay? and melons and the importance of watermelon and melons because they help to clean and cleanse the body. Um, but did you all know that it was a superfood that also helps to fill our melanin? Next video. So this is so important because we're talking about something, that we're talking about what we need. And, you know, of course, she, like she said, it's been vilified, right? Oh, you know, but at the end of the day, um, this is a plant that comes uh, straight out of Africa, okay? It's only here because we brought it here, <laughs> okay? And it is so good for us. It has, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, really is extremely helpful um, in terms of what it's able to do. It gives us energy, um, just so many kind of nutritional benefits. So yes, and that yellow watermelon is actually the original. Did y'all know that? Okay, so embrace these fruits and vegetables because they're gonna be and so important for you um, and to understand how to kind of start to, you know, really practice, um, you know, making bad, uh, de healthy decisions. So. Again, when we're talking about mental health, 
um, all of this impacts our mental health. Food, the foods that you're choosing can impact your mental health, okay? Foods have a vibration. So if you're choosing low vibration foods um, or acidic foods, foods that are not giving you energy, then you could that could be the one thing that's really making your mental health uh, or messing with your mental health. It could be, you know, making you angry and, 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 and all of these things, and you don't even know that it's the food that you're consuming. There's another, there are studies that, that show uh, in, in uh, documentaries that talk about how when you consume meat, you're consuming the fear that that animal had before it was killed. <laughs> Serious. Only facts up here, people, okay? Only facts. So imagine, because again, that, that animal is going through what? As they're going through, waiting in that line, they're going through what? Trauma. They're going through trauma. <laughs> I'm so serious. I'm so serious. So we have to be very conscious about what we're putting on bodies and the vibration that it has and uh, what that does to us. There is a brother, Bobby Wright, uh, out of Chicago, who wrote and talked about um, his term menticide, okay? And we can't talk about black mental health and African-centered mental health without talking about menticide. And what he said was that it's a destruction of the undermining of a person's mental independence in order to alter his or her beliefs. That's really, really profound, okay? It's messing with your, in, in, uh, your independence. It's messing with your beliefs. And this is extremely important for us as cultural, as cultural folk because we, are not, we want to practice our culture. We want to be cultured. Um, but when we cannot do that, that is actually impeding and infringing upon on our mental health. He goes on further and says it is a process of systemically altering beliefs, attitudes, especially through the use of drugs, torture, or psychological stress techniques, brainwashing. Psychological stress techniques. This, to me, is so, so critical, okay? We've already, I mean, one of the things that we talk about is how our school systems ultimately do not teach for our, our culture, do not uh, help our children learn about themselves, and that is a psychological stress technique. Real talk, right? So there's so many already in society that we have to be really careful about what we're taking on. But the pandemic was also an onslaught of psychological stress techniques, okay? And we're gonna look at that, how that, that in a second and how that's playing out. So you would think with all of this going on, all of these things going on with black people that we would think we have a, there, that, that uh, we would think it's a problem, right? That we would think it's an issue, right? And we would want to address it. Well, and this is pre-pandemic, again, in terms of black mental health, 63% um, oops, 63% of African Americans believe that their depression is a personal sign of weakness. 63%, okay? And this is not good <laughs> because more of us are dealing with mental health now since the pandemic, right? So that means that maybe this number has even gone up, all right? But 63%, okay, what's the next one? 56% of African Americans believe that depression is a normal sign of aging. That's deep. So this means that, you know, the, the, the symptoms that you have, that fight or flight, you know, when fight or flight is when, you know, in the body when it's like, and describe it as like if you saw a lion, if you were going to take the trash out and you saw a lion, <laughs> your body currently goes into fight or flight like that. It's like, well, should you, should you fight or should you leave? <laughs> I don't know about y'all, but I'm leaving. I don't know, they say you should like not move and just stare it down. I think that's, you're supposed to do that, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but, but that's fight or flight. Now, when you're in fight or flight, because the body is brilliant, right? It's brilliant. So the body releases these chemicals within you, okay? So that you can get ready to fight, all right? And these chemicals are, are ultimately keeping your body like on alert, okay? Um, now, that fight or flight condition is not good for you. 
because while you're on alert, it actually, your immune system is impacted, right? You're not, you can't, you're not thinking straight. You know, it's hard to do cognitive functions and think critical thinking. You're not thinking about anything, but think about this fighter, or this lion. So the body is prepared to fight, but it's not a good position to stay in and actually causes, some can, can cause harm in a pr prolonged state. Well, that's what happens. So when we experience trauma and we experience uh, stress and we're in, in anxiety, these kind of things, ultimately we can, be, we can ultimately end up in a prolonged fight or fight, which makes it easier than for disease to happen to us, okay? And this is extremely important, especially if you think that it <laughs> depression is a personal sign of weakness. This means that you might know that you might be going through depression, but you're just gonna keep pushing forward. Okay, um, it's, it's, it's extremely important. So this, um, this is one of the things that we can, one of the things we can do to, to start to change and take this into our own hands is, is starting to raise these conversations in our homes with our children, with our brothers and sisters, our aunties, our uncles, our, our mothers, our, our fathers, our grandmothers, our grandfathers, our cousins, our, you know, what are we doing? What are we to talk about how to really address this? And, and how, uh, and, and we'll talk about, um, you know, some of the, the ways that we can do that, um, both uh, with ourselves and with each other. So, in terms of uh, black and people, in, uh, and particularly in terms of mental health, we, now, we took, and <laughs> we took uh, about 50 minutes just to get to this slide. Do you all understand the context? that we have to talk about before we can talk about mental health in this country. This is from an African center perspective. See, white folks will come up here and talk about mental health and they'll talk about social determinants of health and they don't, they don't wanna talk about nothing that came before this country. But an African center scholar has to start with before we were here when we were great, when we were kings and queens, when we were running civilizations, then we came here. And that's why we have mental health issues that are higher than everywhere else. Do you all understand? And it's important to understand that because we have to teach from that place all, at all times and all costs. We have to understand our greatness so that we're not having this conversation in a vacuum and saying, oh, it's because that, you know, uh, you know no, one, no one wants to go see a psychologist and we're just, you know, we're, we're impoverished and we don't know any better. That's the narrative that well, they'll keep replaying to us. We have to understand, no, this comes from a long, <laughs> long, 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 long period of um, kind of, you know, dealing with menticide in the black community. And so what that has led to is seven million people with mental health issues. And that probably is higher now um, because of the pandemic, okay? And that's just 16% having reported it in the past year, they'll say like 20%, right? One in five, okay? Um, and this is important too because while they're saying one in five that might have a mental health challenge, 50% um, of white folks, of white people get this kind of, they'll get the mental health services they need, while only 35% of black people are getting the mental health services they need. So this is why, you know, we have to be very careful because while as this happens to us, um, we are less likely to get the help that we need. So this is a little busy and I just, this is, uh, and I'll go through this quickly, but this is all data uh, from the pandemic and, and mental health conditions from the pandemic, okay? And so it shows just kind of who reported having a, a kind of increased uh, mental health distress since the pandemic. Talks about men here at 17%, uh, 23% for black women, um, and just kind of how this has gone up since the pandemic. This one here talks about K through 12 parents saying, um, that first year of COVID had a negative impact on their kids' education and emotional well-being, okay? Now, we all know this to be true, kind of like we get it, but this is the data here showing it, okay? Um, here, 51% uh, in terms of education and then 48% in terms of emotional well-being. 
Huge, 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 all right? We also know that um, suicide rates have gone up amongst our uh, black and brown babies, okay? And so we are seeing higher rates of suicide. This one talks about um, more likely to report feeling sad or hopeless in the past year, okay? So again, we're starting to see these numbers as a result of, of, of COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And then of course, um, this one talks about parents being concerned about it because of social media and things of that nature. So we have to get a hold of this. We have to get in front of it. And, um, you know, there are some tools that we can use and some strategies. Now, again, I talked about survival mode, fight or flight, okay, and what it does to the body, all right? Um, here are some, some what, it, what it can actually contribute to, especially prolonged survival mode, memory loss, hypervigilance, okay, lacking empathy, inability to focus, impulsive behaviors, uh, you're apathetic towards life, you don't really care, you're just like, well, whatever, you know. Uh, reacting to small things, kind of blowing them out of proportion, constantly having low energy, distorted negative beliefs about yourself, and the in inability to prioritize your own basic needs, okay? So if these are things that you kind of resonate with, um, then you really want to kind of pay attention to some of these next slides because uh, we're going to talk about how can we address some of these things. Now, here we're talking about the uh, effects of racial trauma on our children. So that's kind of what that might do to us. Kind of what does racial trauma do to our children? Um, so for children 6 to 11, they may you know, uh, we talked about, right, the gunshots and things of that nature, or watching those videos or hearing about something, or being in a, in, a, in a store and having something happen to them or seeing something happen to you. These events have, leave imprints on our children, okay? Um, so what does that look like? They may worry the event may happen to them. Uh, they may have preoccupation for their safety or that loved one. I'll give you all an example. Um, we got into a car accident with my children. I think uh, my youngest, who's nine at right now, is probably maybe five, five or four. But there was a while in the last couple of years was always concerned about an accident, always asking about an accident, or, or not the accident, but always making sure that we weren't about to have another accident, okay? And this is probably, like, I mean, he's extremely perceptive at, at, at everything. So I, you know, but I was constantly having to reassure him that we would be okay, you know. So that's the um, having a preoccupation for their safety and their loved ones. Um, worrying, anxiety that can turn into, you know, um, distractibility issues, okay. And then when we're talking about 12 to 17, um, they can have, better cognitive understanding of events and implications, um, but they can be still forming identity as the views of the world. So they may develop a fixation on the events as a coping mechanism, um, and they're getting higher levels of exposure via social media, okay? So we really have to watch our children. We have to pay atten close attention to them. We have to be mindful. We have to ask them, <laughs> you know, beyond the how are you doing, because um, my 11-year-old son knows how to say good every time. Every, <laughs> every time, right? So uh, I stop, you know, I'll ask that, but then I'll, or how did school go? Good. But then I'll say, well, what did you learn today? That's the question I always hit them with. And I always get a different answer. And they say that if you can teach someone what you learned, then you really learned it. You actually internalized it. So that's what we want, you know, like it's, 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 a, it's a challenge, but how are we asking different questions so that we can get at where our, our children are um, socially, emotionally? Um, so let's keep going because I really want to get to the tools uh, and we're coming to it now. So what do what we talk about? We're talking about tools for improving mental health, all right? So some of it comes in um, kind of, you know, self-regulation, okay? Um, and this is kind of like neuropsychology, uh, you know, thinking, you know, kind of getting yourself to start self-regulating. 
Um, so that's a, one strategy, all right? If you're stressed, breathing, using the psychological sigh, okay, and taking deep breaths. We're actually gonna practice some deep breaths in a second, so don't you worry, because I know some of you are like, you know, can we practice a deep breath? Yeah. <laughs> yes, because I teach meditation to, I, I create a program for uh, t uh, three to five year olds, um, you know, toddlers, uh, youth, and even adults. And one of the things, I first thing I start with is how to breathe, the what you know, the way you're supposed to breathe, because when you are when when children are born, and they're laying on their belly or their backs, their belly is going up, and then it's going down, and it's going up, and it's going down. And they are breathing the way that you are supposed to breathe, that your body is intended to breathe. Well, as we go through life, and life life happens, and life keeps life in. Uh, and we develop all of these things, we start breathing, our shoulders go up, <laughs> and our shoulders go down, <laughs> and our shoulders go up. And so we are no longer breathing into our diaphragms, and we are not getting the oxygen that our body needs. We're not getting a lot of things. We'll see in a second, some of the things that we're, we're missing out on. So that's why I teach breathing into the diaphragm and taking deep breaths. It is extremely important, and it actually can help. Um, really on the mental health side, it is, it is one of the best tools that we have to offer is deep breaths, especially when things are going, you know, when, you, when, you're, when you're stressed. But you have to practice deep breathing and meditate, meditative breathing when you're not stressed. <laughs> so you have developed that kind of, um, you know, the, the, you know, like it's, it's, it's just, it's automatic, okay? And, and so that when you get in those situations, you have more, um, you know, more of that practice. Um, okay, so we've got that stress piece. When you're anxious, all right? Um, sometimes I deal with anxiety, all right? You know, um, so walking for, you know, really helps to get you out of that anxiety, all right? Um, very, very important. Uh, when you're sad, okay, acknowledging your feelings and then moving uh, your body to release endorphins, all right? Um, we are gonna do, talk about yoga, okay, in a second, um, as one of the th ways to help keep you um, really moving through the energy th uh, and, and removing and releasing the energy that we don't want to hold on to, right? That, that stress, that anxiety, um, those, you know, and, and so yoga is a part of that and this movement piece here is, is really important. Also, uh, if you're impulsive or angry, um, dilating your gaze, looking outside the window, um, this really can help release so that you can think clearly, okay? So again, these are quick things that you can do. All right. Um, if you have low motivation, focus on one spot of your screen for one minute to release, you know, this kind of adrenaline um, and increase focus. OK, um, it's extremely important because sometimes we've got a lot going on, especially in the day in the, in, in the, uh, in the workspace. Um, so you have to mix it up. OK, if you're in one space, get up, go for a walk, um, look away, take deep breaths. You know, uh, th also uh, that's not on here, but um, which is very important is like having um, affirmations and mantras and things like that so that you can really give yourself that positive mindset uh, that you need. Uh, and then lastly here, if there's low self-worth and secure, writing down your strengths, uh, this engages local thinking which overrides the uh, limbic system. One of the things, uh, this is a good, you know, that is, that is really powerful that comes out of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, is that they would have, and this actually would help for all of these, is that every day, part of their practice, they would, they would draw the subconscious on paper. They would draw the subconscious. Now the subconscious is responsible for like, I think 85, 90% of what everything we do. <laughs> From walking to everything, subconscious is just constantly active. But so every day they're drawing their subconscious, they're dumping the things on paper that they don't want to have in them, okay? And it's getting things out of them that they didn't even know they had in them. <laughs> and they're putting it on paper. And that is another practice that you can use to get, to clean, to cleanse and clean and to, and to, to purge your mind. Very important, powerful practice. Um, we'll take questions at the end. Excellent question. Um, so. One of the things, I think it's similar to like free writing, 
where you're not going into it with any particular drawing in mind. You're just letting what you comes up, what what you draw on the paper, draw, just letting it flow. So that I think is an example. However, it's also um, it's also similar to. Um, it reminds me of another uh, study, or not study, but um, uh, another case where this woman who had cancer, uh, she drew her on, on um, a canvas, uh, painted, I should say, on canvas every day, okay, for six months, in addition to doing meditation and yoga, which we're going to talk about, right, um, and then the cancer was gone, okay? So this is showing the power of the mind and how important it is for us to get out negative and draw and release and, and kind of in conjunction with some of these other things that we're doing, they call it um, complementary and alternative medicine or CAM, okay? So we have to use, you know, now they call it complementary and alternative as an African and center scholar, we just say it's African and indigenous, okay? These are, this, these are our practices that we've been using for generation to generation. So it's not complementary to us <laughs> and it's not alternative to us it's alternative to the medical system, if that makes sense. So these are things that are there, um, but we just don't know, we're not, you, we don't even know that they work, uh, that they're that effective. But it's really important that we understand all of the la layers and levels um, of how to do that. So yeah, just drawing without kind of, you know, telling yourself, prescribing what you're gonna draw is really important, but that's a great question. Um, and, you know, it's gonna be different every day. That's the beautiful thing about it. And even if it isn't, you know, that's okay too. But when you do those drawings, now you have something to talk about with your psychologist. Now you have something maybe to meditate around or to push out or, you know, so it's, 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 a, it's, a, um, it's kind of a, a reciprocal, you know, it's, it's, it's a part of, it's, it's one part of the process and these tools are one part and the idea is that you wanna really be doing them all. You wanna do as many as you can, right? Eating alkaline and eating the best for, your, for you is one of the tools, and you want to do that in conjunction with all of these other pieces because, again, we're talking about how mental health is interconnected and is a part of the whole. It's not, it's not separate. Um, all right, so the other things that you can do. Yes. <laughs> no problem. Mm-hmm. Okay, can you hold the question for for the end? But please, can you hold the question for the end, please? What? One second for the question. Just for one second for the question. Okay, thank you. But I do want to repeat. You're absolutely right. She said that um, the the drawing is like doodling or freestyling. It's similar, and you know, yes, the goal is just to draw. Absolutely. But she wants to get to the meditation. I do too. She says seven minutes. I got 18. So um, that means we got to move it. Yes, so she asked a question about chakras. Um, excellent question. The chakras actually do come from ancient Kemet. That's one of the first, that's in ancient Egypt. They were the first uh, civilization to actually talk about chakras. We know this because they documented on the pyramids and in, uh, they had a lot of texts as well. Uh, so yes, they talked about chakras. What is a chakra? Well, a chakras are our energy systems in, um, in our, um, and their energy systems um, that are uh, moving throughout the body essentially. Uh, and so there are seven, um, there's, you know, different chakras uh, going from like your uh, root chakra all the way up to your crown chakra, essentially, okay? And each chakra has um, a different uh, frequency, different color, different, again, uh, vibration, um, but it also represents a different part of you. There's a throat chakra and things of that nature, right? Sometimes one chakra is, um, clogged or, or what have you, or, or, not, um, or, or stagnant, and you need to clean, um, you need to help to open up that chakra. So understanding what's going on with your body energetically is just as important as, um, as, as, as physically uh, in, as well. So thank you for that. Um, 
And this is important. We've seen um, studies that show that um, you can, it's a similar thing with, uh, with plants. You know, if uh, there was a study that a Japanese scientist did with a plant, uh, he took two plants, one he said nothing but great things to, uh, and um, gave them both the same amount of water. The other one, he said all these kind of negative things to this other plant. Which one do you all think grew larger? The positive plant grew larger, okay? And all these negative things, again, we've talked about. So this is why positive is important. So what are some of the positive things we can do? All right, um, you gotta pay attention to your body, thoughts, and feelings, all right? What's going on? Are you clenching your fist? I bite, sometimes I bite my teeth, and I have to, or uh, clenching my teeth, and I'm like, what is going on, right? No, don't just say what's going on, but when are you doing it, okay? When are you doing it? Why are you doing it, all right? Um, you know, these are things you need to pause, you need to kind of ask yourself and, 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 and process, all right, what's going on here? Um, assess what is activating you. Um, do you not feel heard, all right? Do you feel misunderstood? Are you upset about something? Understand the root of your feelings, all right? Um, what's being changed? Are you, you know, are you being challenged? Um, is there a disagreement or something like that? Uh, set boundaries, separate, ensure safety, all right? And empathize with those involved. So just, this is like a process that you wanna be able to you know, um, pause and not en engage in things that are not for you. Other things that we can do, tools. Okay, again, um, we've talking is so important. We're gonna talk about, well, there's a slide here on uh, black psychologists at the end. Talking, finding a, a therapist, a psychologist is really important. Connecting with others, right? Exercise, we talked about exercise, the importance of it. Exercise every day or every week as much as you can. It helps with your mental health. There are studies out there that show this, all right? Relaxation, we're gonna talk about some relaxation techniques, okay? Um, thinking exercises, there are a pin there because that's the similar to the drawing kind of exercises. Mindfulness, this is meditation and yoga, which we're about to talk about. Um, but ultimately, these are some tools. You have to you know, pick and choose, see, see, try them out, see what is for you, but try to do as many as you can. All right, so we're about to do meditation. We're gonna, t we're gonna practice the breathing in a second. But I like to start with this because people don't understand that there are over, there are over 100 studies that talk about the benefits of meditation. Here I have the physical benefits, the mental benefits, and the emotional benefits, okay? This is over t 20 benefits just right here in meditation alone, okay? So what are we talking about? We're talking about improving your sleep habits, okay? Uh, more hours, deeper sleep, reducing your blood pressure, improving your immune system, okay? Um, we're talking about decreasing, you know, problems with ulcers and headaches, uh, improved breathing and heart rate, elevated energy levels, improves your metabolism, helps you lose weight, um, produces more serotonin. Serotonin is like happiness, you know, kind of, you know, chemical moving through your body, very important. Leaves, uh, or excuse me, it, um, lessens inflammatory uh, disorders and asthma. Um, it lessens muscle and joint pain, reduces aging, uh, and it helps reduce, uh, you know, substance abuse. All of those, those are just a few. And then what are we talking about the mental? Since we're talking about mental health, right? Well, it increases your focal, your focus and mental acuity, all right? It helps to increase memory and retention and recall. We talked about in the other slide how stress can help you lose memory, right? Well, here we are talking about how you can get memory back. It uh, helps you to kind of have better decision making and problem solving, better faster information processing, so help to process information faster, helps you manage ADHD and ADD. How many of us know family members with ADHD and ADD? Okay, here we go. Here's something that is n not a drug that can help you with that. Um, and I taught meditation, again, to my children. I teach it to children. I have seen as young as two meditate. So. They, yeah, if you're asking if they can do it, they absolutely can, and they will, and they, children will follow you and, and, and mock and mimic you, 
So if you want them to meditate, guess what you got to do? Meditate. What else? It, uh, anxiety, impulsivity, and depression is decreased. Um, it increases the relaxation and, like, awareness. More mental power during the day. Better communication. Better cognitive skills and creative thinking. And it reduces symptoms of panic and disorder. Okay? Um, and, in, and it also enhances the generation of uh, certain waves in the brain. So all of that is the mental. And now we talk about emotional because when we talk about mental health, we're also talking about emotional uh, kind of challenges as well. So what are we seeing there in terms of mental health or in terms of meditation? It enhances self-esteem and self-acceptance. It is uh, it has it, it helps with less fear, loneliness, depression, and anxiety. So it helps to re reduce those. It increases optimism. Which, which it's very important, right, to be more positive. We were talking about that. Um, helps you give it a better outlook on life. It increases feelings of connection with others. It helps prevent emotional eating and smoking. Didn't we talk about emotional eating? Stress eating? Okay, meditation can help with that. Deep breaths. Um, it improves resilience against pain and adversity. Uh, it helps with a more well-being, just overall well-being. It helps with emotional maturity. So if you have a partner that has low emotional maturity, you might want to meditate with them. See that? I'm helping y'all out. <laughs> You're like, baby, come on, let's meditate. <laughs> I couldn't help it. I couldn't help it. Uh, and it improves mood and emotional intelligence, okay? So uh, when moods, our mood, our sadness, et cetera, we can, we meditation can help improve. All right, so we're going to practice this real quick before I close out. Um, I want you all to put, and we're just going to take a couple deep breaths, but I want you all to put your uh, hands on your diaphragm. Now, your diaphragm is like right here, your belly button, essentially. Okay? Good. Yes. Good. Okay. Y'all good. Yeah. Okay. Wait, well, before we do this, how many, raise your hand if you meditate right now. How many people we have meditate right now? Okay, good. All right, good. So most of you are not meditating. Good. All right. So we're going to take a deep breath. We're going to, our, our stomachs are going to go out and it's going to come back in. We're breathing in through our nose and we're breathing out through our mouth. So we're going to take three deep breaths. All right, here we go. Inhale and exhale. If you feel your shoulders move, take the next deep breath and try to help breathe so your shoulders don't move. Slowly inhale. Exhale. Push it out, push it out, push it out. Very good. Okay, this last one. Here we go. Inhale. And exhale. Raise your hand if you were able to breathe into your diaphragm versus breathing into your, your shoulders just now. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah, I know. That's okay. So practice, practice, practice. But that is the breath. That breath work will get you those, those will help get those, that, those, um, kind of impact you in the way that we just read. So breathing like that. And I like to meditate with music and, you know, five or ten minutes at a time. However, this is also about breathing in those moments of stress and anxiety. So you don't just have to meditate to get that breath and to get the importance of the breath, to get the value of the breath. You can do it when you're, you're challenged, when, when you got stuff going on. So um, yoga as well. Again, I like to teach people about the value of it because when you know what this does for you, you're more likely to do it, okay? It helps you focus and be more mindful. Again, gives you more positive outlook on life, mental health. We need that more positivity. Yoga is giving it to you. It creates mental clarity and calmness. It enhances your, self, your sense of gratitude. It relieves chronic stress patterns. Stress relieves it. It increases body awareness. It helps you manage stress, sharpens your concentration, gives you more energy, helps you sleep better, makes you feel better, develops cognitive skills, reduces anxiety, relaxes the mind, and centers your attention. And for those of you who don't know what yoga is, it's essentially, it's essentially a breathing, stretching practice 
where you are, uh, the body is breathing and stretching. Typically, it happens on a mat or on the floor. Um, and you're literally, it's kind of putting meditation in, and, and breathing and stretching into one. Okay? It comes again from ancient Kemet in ancient Egypt. And we know this. Why? Because that's where they have uh, yoga poses on the pyramids. Okay? S yes. Yes. We think the yoga comes from Indian and, and uh, culture, et cetera, because of the, but actually, no, it, it comes from ancient, ancient Kim and Kemet. So again, this is our culture. When I talk about meditation and yoga, I talk, about, uh, when I'm talking to black folks, this is our culture. Let's reclaim it, okay? Lastly, um, again, the Association of Black Psychologists, please, if you are not, uh, if you don't know about them, they are a great resource for mental health, great for therapists, great for psychologists. Please look them up. Um, and then I work for an organization uh, with Compassion Choices. Um, I'm, I'm the African American director, uh, engagement director, and we help families plan uh, for the end of life. If you don't have a plan, that's contribute. That can contribute to your mental health not being prepared. Okay. So all of these factors are extremely important, and we want to make sure that we have what we need. Um, that is it. Any questions? Not, but we can exchange information. <laughs> I know, I know. We have so many questions. Chris, Chris. Oh. <laughs> right, uh, peace your uh, presentation, Doctor. I want to uh, uh, thank you very much for the uh, information you shared with us. I readily have a, uh, a little reminder I'd like to say in regards to the foods, okay, that we sh uh, should do research, okay, in regards, okay, to G GMO, okay, and artificial foods, all right. Uh, the market, okay, is a trillion or billion dollars industry. So what you have labeled, okay, on foods that they permit you to, that uh, put them ingredients which you have, all right? What I'm saying is that there's a, a recycling, okay, of seedless products on the market, mm. all right? Uh, we have to try to do the best that we can as far as eating the foods, all right? Yes. Because the, the growing out of the ground, okay, is what they fertilize with artificial stuff in here also. Yes. So we have to try to do the best that we can. Yes. However, the genetic air, uh, engineering foods, okay, they have on the label, it's, uh, it's not artificially, mm -hmm. okay, it's supposed to be. But there's too many products on the market that you eat that that's there, that's labeled, that it's okay to eat. And these foods here have been artificially grown. Th so you. that's something that we should be mindful of. And the last part of, uh, of that, is the research is very important, okay, because you think that you are they telling you how many calories and et cetera, but what they only did was just recycle it into artificial food. Even. Absolutely. So I appreciate try that. To be conscious of that. Thank you for that. You're absolutely right. When you, that's uh, really important, and when you're eating that watermelon, you need to eat seeded watermelon. Yeah. And we did not, I did not mention it. It's really hard to find. Um, in fact, in Chicago, there's a truck that comes up from Mississippi with seeded watermelon. So, um, but yes, you know, you're absolutely right. It's uh, extremely important. So thank you, Dr. Hall, an excellent presentation. I appreciated all of it. Thank you. Um, one of the questions that I have, I run a nonprofit um, called Enti Empower the Village, and we have a, a Village Assist Mental Health Initiative. One of the things we're trying to launch are what we're calling village healing circles. Mm. Not everyone can afford one-on-one -on -one counseling, but I'd like your perspective on what group therapy um, could mean in helping our community. That's an excellent question. Thank you uh, for that. Group therapy is actually really important because it actually comes, it goes back to, again, this African and in indigenous way of, of having that um, circle kind of conversation. Uh, um, there's a w uh, term, Ubuntu, uh, which is, uh, comes out of the uh, uh, Congo key s um, space where it means, Congo is, um, it means like, um, I am, therefore we are. And so it's this, it's this uh, a term that means, 
I would not be here without you. And, and if anything happens to you, it happens to me. And it's this uh, idea of creating uh, uh, co-responsibility and reciprocity. So, yeah, you know, there are cultures uh, in Africa that don't even have a, a word for I. They don't even have a term for I. Similar to Hawaii culture, indigenous culture that has like, like I, what is I? There's no I, it's just us. So the group therapy piece is, a, is to me an extension of that African centeredness where we're gonna bring the group together. So I think it's really important. Uh, but I also, but I, it should, but it should not replace though the kind of individual as well. So I think it's both and, not either or. Um, you know, I, but but they're vo they're very important, and we see it in particular with um, um, kind of like um, uh, peace circles and things of that nature, where you know you're bringing folks together and you're having s healing happening um, because we talk about in peace circles like someone has harmed the group. And we're going to bring the group together to, to heal that harm together. No questions. Thank you. A wonderful presentation. I wanted to know, how do we get access to it? Are you making it available for the attendees? Yes, it's uh, $5,000. <laughs> That was another dad joke. That was bad. Um, I th yes, I think that um, we can definitely make that available in the, um, uh, we'll make sure that you all, uh, those that are registered, uh, will share it out. But also, you know, and I, um, if you, uh, this is great for me because this is actually my first presentation. I think somebody mentioned today that they're, I know, right? It's, <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Um, yeah, so, um, so yes, if you all would, you know, I would love to come and, and present w where you all are um, and, and really build this issue out and support the work that you all are doing because this is really uh, important work. So, um, yes, you know, um, that's the idea is also if you, if you need that and support, I can help with that as well. Yes, uh, I did. I don't think I brought one today, but uh, we can definitely exchange information. Absolutely. So I personally would just like to thank Dr. Hall as the chair for the health committee. The health committee has tried to stay relevant, and nothing is more relevant right now than mental health mm. and nutrition and stress-related release uh, relief. So I, I don't think we could have asked for a better speaker. We appreciate you being here, and yet we may ask you to come back, not for 5,000, but <laughs> no. <laughs> but thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, well, thank you again, Dr. Hall, and that will conclude uh, this session. Enjoy the rest of the convention. <laughs>